everybody how are you doing today welcome can you believe it we're just progressing we're on to the next week today we're going to be doing chapter nine and chapter ten let's start off with chapter nine <clears throat> today is all about beginning the speech so we're going to be doing chapter nine how to begin and end a speech let's see everybody's on this page awesome well how we begin a speech effectively. One of the most common complaints novice public speakers have is that they simply don't know how to start a speech. Many times speakers get ideas how to begin their speeches as they go through the process of researching and organizing ideas. In this chapter, we will explore why introductions are important and various ways speakers can create memorable introductions. There may not be one best way to start a speech, but we can provide some helpful guidelines that will make starting a speech much easier. All right. Oops, I'm so sorry. It, for some reason, it started going up. I mean, yeah, up instead of down. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing we want to do is we want to gain attention and interest. The first major purpose of an introduction is to gain your audience's attention and make them interested in what you have to say. One of the biggest mistakes that novice speakers make is they assume that people will naturally listen because the speaker is speaking. While many audiences may be polite and not talk while you're speaking, actually getting them to listen to what you're saying is a completely different challenge. Let's face it, we've all turned to somebody out at some point because we're interested in what they have to say. If you don't know, don't know how to get the audience attention and outset, it will only become more difficult to do as you continue speaking. We'll talk about this some more strategies for grabbing audience attention later on in this chapter. State your purpose of your speech. The second major function of your introduction is to recall and reveal the purpose of your speech to your audience. Have you ever sat through a speech wondering what the basic point was? Have you ever come across after a speech and had no idea what the speaker was? Talking about an introduction is important because it forces the speaker to be mindfully aware of explaining the topic of a speech to an audience. If a speaker doesn't know what his or her topic is and cannot convey that topic to the audience, we really got big problems. Robert Calvert, a founder of the National Speaker Association, used the analogy of a preacher giving a sermon, as he noted, when it's foggy in the pulpit, it's cloudy in the pews. As we discussed chapter six, finding the purpose and selecting the topic, the specific purpose is one idea you want your audience to remember when you finish with your speech. Your specific purpose is a rudder that guides your research, organization, and development of the main points. That more clearly focused on your purpose is easier than your task will become developing your speech. In addition, a clear purpose provides an audience with a single, simple idea to remember even if their daydream during the body of your speech. To develop a specific purpose, you should complete the following sentence. I want my audience to understand that. Notice that your specific speech purpose is phrased in the terms of expected audience responses, not terms of your own perspective. Establish credibility. One of the most researched areas within the field of communications has been Aristotle's concept of ethos or credibility. First and foremost, the concept of credibility must be understood as the perception of the receivers. You may be competent, caring, trustworthy speaker in the world on any given topic, but if your audience doesn't perceive you as credible, then your expertise and passion will not matter. As public speakers, we need to make sure that we explain our audiences and why we're credible speakers on a given topic. James C. McCrosby and Jason J. Calvin have conducted intense research on credibility and have determined that individuals' credibility is composed of three factors, competence, trustworthiness, and caring goodwill. Competence is the degree to which the speaker is perceived to be knowledgeable or an expert in any given subject by audience member. Some individuals are given expert status because of positions they hold in society. For example, Dr. Regina Benjamin of the U.S. Surgeon General is expected to be competent in matters related to health and wellness as a result of being United States top physician. But what if you don't possess a fancy title that leads itself to be established your competence? You need to explain to your audience why you're competent to speak your topic. 
Keep in mind that even well-known speakers are not perceived as universally credible. U.S. Surgeon General Regina Benjamin may have been competent on health and wellness issues, but not seen as a competent speaker on the tens in Latin American music or different ways to cook summer squash. Like well-known speakers, you will need to establish your credibility on a topic you address. So establishing your competence about the energy efficiency of furnace systems during your informative speech doesn't automatically mean you're going to be seen as competent on the topic of organ donation for your persuasive speech. And the second factor of credibility noted by McKenzie and Ten is trustworthiness or the degree to which an audience member perceives the speaker as honest. Nothing will turn the audience against the speaker faster than the audience believes the speaker is lying. When the audience does not perceive a speaker as trustworthy, the information coming out of the speaker's mouth is automatically perceived as deceitful. The speaker could be 100% honest, but the audience will still find the information suspect. For example, in the summer of 2009, many Democratic members of Congress attempted to hold public town hall meetings about health care. For a range of reasons, many of the people who attended these town hall meetings refused to elect officials actually speak about audience were convinced that the congressmen and congresswomen were lying. In these situations, the speaker is in front of the hostile audience. There is little speaker can do to reestablish the sense of trustworthiness. These public town hall meetings became screaming matches between the rifled up audiences and congressional representatives. <clears throat> Some police departments actually ended up having to escort the representatives from the building because they feared their safety. Hold on, I'm trying to get my video to pop up. <clears throat> Okay, so remember, these are the persuasive appeals. We have the logos, which is logical appeal. We have the ethos, which we are talking about right now. That's ethical appeal and credibility. And we have pathos, which is the emotional appeal. <coughs> so we want to look at ethos, pathos, and logos. So this is living by ethos. This is a TED talk. Hold on, I'm trying to pull it up for you. Here we go. This is by Nicholas Levery. So let's say you have to read an incredibly long email from your boss that you have to finish before the big... everybody doing? Good? All right, I'm doing fantastic. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, of the TED platform. I watch them regularly. And what I'm drawn to is how short, concise, succinct, and to the point they are. And they deliver a single message. It's in your face. Bam, it's quick. And I love that. So keeping with that history, I'm going to be brief. All right, so try to keep up. So again, my name is Nick Lavery. From the personal perspective, I am a husband. I'm a father. I'm from Boston, in case you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> uh, I pride myself in being a family man. All right, that is the single greatest aspect of my life. On the professional side of things, I am a Special Forces Warrant Officer more commonly referred to as a Green Beret. 
and I have the privilege to serve as the assistant detachment commander of a special forces detachment, most commonly referred to as an ODA or an A-team. Beyond that, I'm a warrior. So today what I'm gonna focus on is the warrior mindset. As many previous warriors before me and as many after me, in 2013, I had a rough day at the office. I found myself on the business end of a truck mounted PKM machine gun, which ripped apart both my legs. Most damage being to my right, which obviously resulted in its amputation. I would spend a year at Walter Reed Medical Center going through countless surgeries and the early phases of my recovery. I then returned to Fort Bragg where I took a job teaching tactical close quarters combat and hand-to-hand -hand combat while progressing my recovery and my rehabilitation. At that point, I embarked on a grueling process of assessments to return back to operational status, which I was successful at doing. So from the moment I was wounded, approximately two years from that point, I found myself back in Afghanistan, conducting combat operations with the same team I was on when I was injured. I have since deployed three times to combat, and I have one actually coming up here pretty soon. And the questions I am most often asked are different variations of the same two. How and why? How do you continue to do what you do? And why do you continue doing what you do, given what you've already sacrificed at this point? And the answers to those questions can go long and deep. But at its foundation, it is because I live by a series of ethos. So what is that? Ethos is the characteristic spirit of a culture, community, or ideology as manifested in its beliefs and aspirations. In the military, we have a set of warrior ethos. I'm gonna to touch on three of them here today. One, I will always place the mission first. Two, I will never accept defeat. And three, I will never quit. So let's unpack those a little bit. I'll always place the mission first. The word mission obviously has a, a, a military flavor to it, but it absolutely applies to everybody because everybody has goals, everybody has objectives, everybody has things that they are working towards every single day. So the real question becomes, how are you willing to prioritize your own time? What are you willing to sacrifice? Now those priorities have to change day to day, minute to minute sometimes. And life happens to everybody. It's gonna knock you off track. Life gets in the way. And when that happens, how fast do you get back on track, moving towards your goal, moving towards the completion of your mission? Are you willing to sacrifice at any moment who you are, what you are, what you are doing for what you may become. I'll never accept defeat. Failure is a good thing. Defeat is a good thing. In my opinion, we should be consistently and regularly striving for failure because it is in those moments of failure that we learn, that we get better. We learn more through failure than we do through any successes. The real question becomes, when that happens, are you willing to pick yourself back up and keep moving forward? Do you have what it takes to pick your ass up off the ground, conduct some analysis on what went wrong, tweak your strategy, implement that plan, and then execute that plan? 
To summarize this as succinctly as possible, how hard will you work? What level of manpower and man hours are you willing to put in to move towards that goal? Work ethic gets thrown around a lot. And a lot of people truly believe that they work hard. And a lot do. But it's those that are willing to take it to another level that are truly going to break past barriers to accomplish things that they or no one has ever accomplished before. Now, there is no guarantee of success with hard work. But without hard work, there is a guarantee. And that is the guarantee of ultimate failure. Again, I stand here before you humbled. And each day I wake up with, with these ethos in mind. And I'm like anybody else, right? Despite potentially my appearance or some nicknames I have, I'm a human being. When that alarm clock goes off at four o'clock in the morning, there are plenty of days I just want to throw it through the wall. Because it's real easy after 10, 12 hours of sleep to get up and do what you need to do. That's easy. It's on the days when you're tired, you're beat down, you're beat up. Your body is just telling you, hit that snooze button. It is in those moments when you get up and you put that work in anyway, that leads to progression. That leads to progress. The warrior mindset is something that is not exclusive to those that are warriors by trade, to those that are warriors by profession. It is a choice. It's a choice that we, we all have. So I leave you by asking you a few questions. What are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to prioritize your time to reaching your goals and your objectives? How hard are you willing to work? Are you a warrior? Guys, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Lindor, made to melt you by the Lint Master Chocolatier. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Gene Yu, and I'm honored here to be speaking to you this afternoon. I'm going to tell you guys a story today. Uh, about a year and a half ago, in November 2013, a lady named Evelyn Chang had just finished up about 20 years of working in a factory near Shanghai. And she took a vacation to celebrate her retirement with her husband down in uh, Malaysian Borneo, in an island called Pom Pom. And the first night they were there, at about 1 a.m., eight Abu Sayyaf gunmen came across in long boats, climbed into her stilt resort room, grabbed her first out of the bed, breaking her arm, pulling her out of the bed, moved in and then shot her husband eight times, killing him. From there, they put her into the longboat and speared her back into the southern Philippines in a lawless war zone area called the Sulu Archipelago. From there, she was sold from subgroup to subgroup, eventually ending up in an island called Holo into a, uh, a guerrilla camp in the jungle there. Right around that time, uh, I happened to be on gardening leave uh, from Palantir Technologies. I was moving on to my next tech startup. And my mother called me. I was actually here in Hong Kong and told me about this story. And there's not much, not much to it other than that. And it was interesting to me. And I think the reason why she told me at the time was because I actually had done two tours, not as a US Marine Special Forces, it's a US Army Special Forces, a Green Beret. Um, and I had done two tours down in the southern Philippines and was quite well acquainted with this group, Abu Sayyaf. I didn't think much of it at the time. Um, at, a few days later, I actually traveled to Taipei and I was promoting the, uh, the Chinese language version of uh, my semi-fictional humorous books, just about time in my military, my military experience, called uh, Yellow Green Beret. Uh, they're actually bestsellers now here in Taiwan. Yeah, it's a joke. My sister came up with it, Yellow Green Beret. So uh, under the pen name caricature uh, Chester Wong. 
So anyway, so I was doing a lot of uh, uh, media talks at the time uh, in Taipei. And of course, this came up because this was a huge story in Taiwan. Uh, nothing had happened like this before to a Taiwan national. Everybody was shocked. There's, a, there's this feeling in Taiwan all the time that the government is powerless to do anything. So that night, uh, I went home uh, to see my mom. And we talked about the story. And she actually told me that her best friend in high school, uh, Angela Chang, was the older. OK. Um, this one, I don't want us to watch till later. Okay, so this is all about doing the right thing. We are always doing the right thing. And in the video you just watched, the gentleman, he actually was permanently injured because he did the right thing. No. And... Part of ethics is being ethical and credible and doing what you told somebody you were gonna do. And sometimes that, sometimes in the video you just saw, sometimes that happens <clears throat> where we find ourselves in a rock and hearts place, right? The next video we're gonna watch is about somebody who rescued somebody who was kidnapped. Both of the stories have people going out of their way, putting themselves in harm ways to help others because it's the right thing to do. It's ethical and they're going by their word. Now, some people say things and they don't follow through and that's unethical because if you're going to do say something, you should follow through with it. I'm sure there's tons of people you can think of that break promises all the time to you. And you ask yourself, that doesn't make sense because I follow through with what I say I'm going to do, but other people don't follow through, right? And if anything, we're doing what God wants us to do. God wants us to follow through. If we say we're going to do something, we need to do it. And that's how Jesus was when he was here. He followed through. He was a credible individual. We shouldn't aim to emulate and be just like Jesus, right? Who do you want to be like? I want to be like Jesus. Okay, so back on chapter nine. Sorry, with the videos, it went back to the beginning. So <clears throat> we do want to gain our audience's attention. It's really important that we gain the audience's attention. We want to give the audience reasons to listen. Why, why are they listening to us? Is it because we're so cool? No, it's because we have something important to say. Carrying goodwill is a final factor of credibility noted by McKenzie. Goodwill refers to the degree to which the audience member perceives a speaker as caring about the audience members. If a receiver does not believe that the source has the best intentions in mind for the receiver, the Receiver will see the source as credible. Simply put, we're going to listen to people who think truly care about us and are looking out for welfare. As a speaker, then you need to establish that your information is being presented because you care about your audience and not just trying to manipulate them. We should note that research has indicated that caring goodwill is the most important factor of credibility. This means that if an audience believes that the speaker truly cares about the audience's best interest, the audience may overlook some confidence and trust issues. Provide reasons to listen. The fourth major reason of an introduction is to establish connection between the speaker and the audience. And one of the most effective means of establishing a connection with the audience is to provide them with reasons why they should listen to your speech. The idea of establishing a connection is the extension of the not notation of caring and goodwill. In the chapters on language and delivery, we'll spend a lot more time talking about how you can establish a good relationship with your audience. However, the relationship starts the moment you step in front of the room and you start speaking. Instead of assuming that the audience will make their own connection to your material, you should explicitly state how your information might be useful to your audience. <clears throat> 
However, the relationship starts the moment that you step in front of the room. So even before you start speaking, you are making a presence. Your nonverbal speaks a lot. The way you dress, the way you present yourself, do you look approachable? Are you smiling? Are you giving eye contact to your audience? Do you look like you're there to have a good time and enjoy being with others? Or you look like you're forced to be there. You look mad. You don't look happy. You don't look inviting. And your audience members might be scared to listen to what you have to say. So when we're thinking about our speech, we have to make sure we have attention getter and appropriateness or relevance to the audience. You don't want to speak over their head, but you don't want to speak under them either. You don't want them to feel like you're talking down to them. And we also have purpose of the speech, the topic, and the occasion. We have relevance to subject, relevance to audience, quotation, a reference to current events, historical reference, antidote, another device you can use to start a speech is to tell an antidote related to the speaker's topic. An antidote is a brief account or story of an interesting or humorous event. Notice the emphasis here is the word brief. A common mistake speaker make when telling an antidote is to make antidote too long. We have startling statements. The eighth device you can use to start your speech is to surprise your audience with startling information about your topic. Often startling statements come in the form of statistics and strange facts. The goal of a startling statistic is that it surprises the audience and gets them engaged in your topic. For example, if you're giving a speech about oil conservation, you can start by saying a Boeing 447 airliner holds 50,285 gallons of fuel. You can start with this speech on the psychology of dreams by noting the average person has over 1,460 dreams a year. A strange fact, on the other hand, is the statement does not involve a number, but equally surprising most audiences. For example, you can start a speech on gambling history by saying there are no clocks in casinos in Las Vegas. You can start a speech in the Harlem Globe Charles by saying in 2000, Pope John Paul II became the most famous honorary member of the Harlem Globe Trotters. All four of these examples are great websites for strange facts. You can also start off with a question. Uh, another strategy for getting your audience attention is ask them a question. There are two types of questions commonly used as attention getters, response questions and rhetorical questions. A response question is the audience that the audience is expected to answer in some manner. For example, you could ask the audience, raise your hand if you ever thought of backpacking through Europe. Or have you ever voted for electoral college? Humor, you can use humor. It's another effective method of gaining audience attention. Humor is an amazing tool when used properly. We cannot begin to explain all the amazing facets of humor within the text, but we can say that humor is a great way of focusing the audience on what you're saying. However, humor is a double-edged sword. If you do not wield the sword carefully, you turn your audience against you very quickly. When using humor, you really need to know your audience to understand what they will find humorous. One of the biggest mistakes a speaker can make is to use some form of humor that the audience either does not find funny or finds offensive. Personal reference, the tenth device you may consider is to start your speech is to refer to the story about yourself that's relevant for your topic. Some of the best speeches are the ones that come from personal knowledge and experience. If you're an expert or have firsthand experience related to your topic, mm. sharing information with the audience is a great way to show that you're credible during your attention getter. For example, if you had gastric bypass surgery and you wanted to give information about a speech about a procedure, you can introduce just about your speech like this, this way. In fall 2008, I decided it would be time that I took my life into my own hands. After suffering years with disease of obesity, I decided to take a leap of faith and get gastric bypass to attempt to finally beat the disease. If you use personal example, you don't get carried away with the focus of yourself and your life. Your speech topic is the purpose of attention getter. On the other way around, another pitfall in using personal example is that it may be too personal for you to maintain your composure. For example, a student once started a speech about my grandmother by stating my grandmother died of cancer at 3.30 in the morning. The student then proceeded to 
to cry nonstop for 10 minutes. Well, this extreme example, we strongly recommend that you avoid any material that could get you over to while speaking and the speakers have emotional breakdown during their speech. Audience members stop listening to the message and become very uncomfortable. You can do reference on occasion. Last advice we mentioned starting a speech is to refer directly to the speaking occasion. This attention getter is only useful if the speech is being delivered for spe specific occasion. Many toasts, for example, start with the following statement. Today, we are going to honor X. In this case, X could be a retirement, a marriage, a graduation, or any number of other special occasions. Because of this specific nature, this attention getter is least likely to be used for speeches delivered for college courses. So remember, attention getters can include references to the audience, quotations, references to current events, historical references, anecdotes, startling statements, questions, humor, personal references, and references on occasion. Putting it together, complete your introduction. The next video we're going to watch is a gentleman talking about rescuing somebody that was kidnapped. And in his speech, he talks about doing the right thing and helping somebody. So we're gonna watch this right now. We can see right here, he looks comfortable. His hand is in his pocket, which could look like he's just too comfortable, but he's giving eye contact and he does look like he's leaning forward, which is presenting it as if he's inviting you to listen to what he has to say. And he is smiling here and he's smiling here. So he has a smiling pictures. Okay, here we go. Uh, my name is Gene Yu and I'm honored here to be speaking to you this afternoon. I'm gonna tell you guys a story today. Uh, about a year and a half ago in November, 2013, uh, a lady named Evelyn Chang had just finished up about 20 years of working in a factory near Shanghai. And she took a vacation to celebrate her retirement with her husband down in uh, Malaysian Borneo, in an island called Pom Pom. The first night they were there at about 1 a.m., Eight Abu Sayyaf gunmen came across in long boats, climbed into her stilt resort room, grabbed her first out of the bed, breaking her arm, pulling her out of the bed, moved in and then shot her husband eight times, killing him. From there, they put her into the long boat and speared her back into the southern Philippines in a lawless war zone area called the Sulu Archipelago. From there, she was sold from subgroup to subgroup, eventually ending up in an island called Holo into a, uh, a guerrilla camp in the jungle there. Right around that time, uh, I happened to be on gardening leave uh, from Palantir Technologies. I was moving on to my next tech startup. And my mother called me. I was actually here in Hong Kong and told me about this story. And there's not much, not much to it other than that. And it was interesting to me. And I think the reason why she told me at the time was because I actually had done two tours, not as a US Marine Special Forces, a US Army Special Forces, a Green Beret. Um, and I had done two tours down in the Southern Philippines and was quite well acquainted with this group, Abu Sayyaf. I didn't think much of it at the time. Um, at, a few days later, I actually traveled to Taipei, and I was promoting the, uh, the Chinese language version of uh, my semi-fictional humorous books, just about time in my military, my military experience, called uh, Yellow Green Beret. Uh, they're actually bestsellers now here in Taiwan. Yeah, it's a joke. My sister came up with it, Yellow Green Beret. So, uh, under the pen name caricature, uh, Chester Wong. So anyway, so I was doing a lot of uh, uh, media talks at the time uh, in Taipei, and, of course, this came up because this was a huge story in Taiwan. Uh, nothing had happened like this before to a Taiwan national. Everybody was shocked. There's, a, there's this feeling in Taiwan all the time that the government is powerless to do anything. So that night, uh, I went home uh, to see my mom, and we talked about the story, and she actually told me that her best friend in high school, uh, Angela Chang, was the older sister of Evelyn Chang. And she had flown back from Florida to try to handle the situation, and they were looking for any type of help. So I happened to be in Taipei at the time, so I said, sure, why don't we have breakfast and I'll at least just listen to the story and then see if I can give some advice. So we met in the morning and the entire Chang fan came out, okay, 10, 10 people. And we met for breakfast and I saw the desperation in their faces and realizing that they had no recourse or anybody could help them. Uh, Taiwan is not a, uh, a, uh, a recognized country. There's no official diplomatic relations between Taiwan and the Philippines. If, uh, if anybody's been in the Philippines and understands the security apparatus there, both the police and military are rife with corruption. There was nobody really helping them out. Um, and I looked at their situation and realized that out of all the options that they had, all the shitty options that they had, I was the best one out of that. And when I looked at it and I said, well, okay, I've been out of the military for, at that time, five years. 
all my contacts and relationships are dead in the Philippines. When I say dead, sorry, I don't mean they're deceased. I mean, I don't, they're not active. So, um, apologies. <laughs> now, so I made some phone calls, uh, actually, uh, back to my personal network in special operations and started looking for mercenaries or private security contractors to help. I made a few phone calls. Uh, they were all based in the Philippines. And at that point, I looked at myself and I said, okay, I'm on gardening leave right now. I got the time. And the only thing I had in my schedule was uh, my friends actually here in Hong Kong and organized this trip to Nepal to climb to the base camp of Mount Everest. They're sitting right there. <laughs> and that was the only thing I had in my, uh, my agenda at the time. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I knew that if I walked away from this, knowing that I could have helped in some way, that I would regret it for the rest of my life. Looking at their faces at that breakfast and knowing that nobody could help them, but just even a little bit that I could help, then I should get involved. So I got on a plane and I went to Manila. Uh, over about a 30-day uh, period, uh, I recruited, at, I recruited a, uh, a mercenary named, private security contractor named John Olofsson. We worked together for about a week and discovered exactly which subgroup she had been uh, sold to and uh, all the intelligence around her exact location. By that time, you can imagine, this is all one of the shocking things for me in terms of learning and approaching this problem set when it was ongoing was that I never realized in my time in the US military, everywhere I went, whether it was Iraq, Philippines, uh, missions all around Middle East and Southeast Asia, there was always this ready-made, amazing logistical machine of the US military, as well as colleagues that I could depend on and trust, because I knew they were trained and I knew they were trustworthy. In this situation, I was by myself, and everybody I'd met, the people that present themselves, that can help under the nose of the official government and police, who are those type of people that come out to help? I was taking meetings with gun runners, drug smugglers, uh, all these type of people who said that they could claim to help. And who can you trust when you talk to these folk? Even private security contractors who are essentially mercenaries or killers for hire, can you trust them really with your life in, in, in their hands? That was probably the biggest challenge, I would say, out of all of this. About a week went by and we had met several nefarious characters who were uh, quite corrupt and trying to exploit uh, the situation. Uh, everybody's got their hand in the pockets of this type of business. The Abu Sayyaf take, take hostages for two reasons. One is they need to finance their terrorist activity, right? So they're ransoming out people. Currently, right now, there's, I believe, 16 hostages still down in the Philippines. One's been down there for five years. Several Europeans have been down there for three. They're quite, down there quite a long time. They haven't been able to extract ransoms for those folk, but why do they keep them around? It's because they use them as human shields for the war that's going on down there, okay? Because the Philippine military is very concerned for collateral damage of innocent civilians. So they know that if there's a foreign uh, hostage inside the camp, then they're less, uh, less inclined to attack that base. So that's why, that's the two reasons for people to be down there. After a week uh, of being down there and running into roadblock after roadblock and talking to worse and worse characters in the, in the very, very dangerous areas inside Manila and in the slums, a man kind of emerged through my network at West Point. Um, I'm a 2001 graduate of West Point. This man was a 1993 graduate. His name is Dennis Eckler, and he was a lieutenant colonel in the Philippine Scout Rangers. He pretty much emerged almost out of nowhere out of one of my contacts of a former West Point professor and told me that he'd been following this for the last week. It was a quite a big story in the Philippines as well. And he told me that he would help me. And why? Because we were West Pointers. He told me that many, many times during our time. This is a West Point to West, West Pointer to West Pointer thing. This is why I'm helping you. Dennis assembled a team of Filipino operatives, about 15 folk. They started moving in and we started conducting uh, negotiations directly with the, uh, the hostage takers. Um, I can't get into too many of the details on the actual recovery because we ended up signing a lot of NDAs because of an unknown and un, an unspecified government support. Um, but essentially, uh, I'll tell you one story. Uh, during, the, uh, during the actual negotiations, while we were talking about the ransom, which was started at 5 million US, um, there was at one point that I was worried that Evelyn was undergoing Stockholm Syndrome. For those who don't know, Stockholm Syndrome is this, this ca famous case in, uh, in Stockholm, Sweden, where uh, the, hostage t the hostages uh, during a bank robbery actually started siding with the hostage takers. And then when the actual police came in and rescued them, they fought they fought against the police because they sympathized so much with the, uh, with the, uh, the bad guys. So this, this is actually a very common uh, syndrome because of the stress uh, of your life being on the line that people tend to try to rationalize the good in human beings and then side with, with the takers. And so I started seeing that in the, in the conversations that we're having uh, during proof of life conversations with Evelyn was that she started, it started feeling like she was siding with, the, uh, with the Abu Sayyaf and she was screaming hysterically on the phone 
with uh, her family members back in Taiwan and telling them, just sell everything we've got, do anything you can to get me out of here, um, while they, uh, in any case, just incited quite a bit of emotional reaction. So at a certain point, I got on the phone and uh, pretended to be a Taiwanese physician and spoke in Chinese the entire time and told her who I was. I didn't tell her my name, but I told her that I've got, I had several years of, I was a counter-terrorist uh, American commander. I had several years of experience in this and I was doing everything I could, 24 hours, days, seven days a week to try to get her out. And we needed her to remember, do not forget who the enemy is. I told her this three times. Do not forget who the enemy is. At the time, Evelyn later told me that that was a watershed moment for her because it switched in her mind knowing that it wasn't just her older brother and older sister Angela trying to help her to get out, but there was somebody behind the scenes that was actually working and that was professional and could get her out. And she changed her mindset and her morale at that, at that time. Unfortunately for me at that moment, at that time the captors, while I was speaking in Chinese, the entire time were screaming at her to tell, her to speak in, to tell me to speak in English over and over. By the time I finished tell, telling her the last, time, the last time not to forget who the enemy was, the captors got on the phone, said to me in English, you're a Taiwanese spy, we're cutting her head off, and they hung up on me. I couldn't, I couldn't get a hold of her, or we couldn't open up another line of communication for three days. I was pulling my hair out. I thought that I had completely overstepped. I thought that I made a mistake. I thought that I had killed her, essentially. Uh, fortunately, Dennis was able to open up a second secret line of communication, and negotiations commenced again. Like I said, unfortunately, I can't go into details of the actual recovery operation. But I can tell you that out of three of the Filipino operatives that, we, that went in, uh, I was able to petition for them for Medals of Valor from the Republic of China and Taiwan. It's the first time that Medals of Valor have ever been awarded to foreigners from Taiwan, and it was specifically for heroism and actions on the objective. Um, Another key moment of this is besides, it, there was, so essentially there were two teams, one uh, of the private security contractors or mercenaries that we had hired, and then here with Dennis's team. Right before we went in, Dennis actually went up the chain of command and asked for approval to go in. And he said, hey look, we've been working on this for the last few weeks, this is where it's at, we're ready to do this. And all the way up the chain of command, he was actually told to stand down. And I remember when we were in that safe house down in Mindanao, Dennis turned around and looked at his team and said, look, we've been ordered to stand down. I'm still going in, who's going with me? And every single one of those men raised their hands and volunteered, put their lives on the line for Evelyn. A stranger that they never ever met. And for me, a person that they had never met. On the way out, uh, we had to stop by a marine base on, uh, on Holo. The team had to stop by. Uh, they were very shocked to see the famous Taiwanese hostages come in and for reasons unknown even today, uh, the Marine Colonel, the Filipino Marine Colonel turned around and immediately called the media and said, we've rescued her, okay? and took credit for it. Dennis told me many times during this operation, nobody wanted to step up to help. And he said, success has many mothers and fathers, but failure has none. And that's a really last, long lasting lesson for me out of, this, out, of this, uh, out of this mission. And I saw it immediately afterwards of all different folks, Taiwanese politicians, Malaysians, Filipino police, military, all trying to claim credit for this operation. It's an amazing experience actually just to watch that in its aftermath. Uh, as we, uh, we had to move out of the Philippines, um, as soon as the media uh, found out about the operation, uh, Dennis said through his, uh, his network that not only were the Filipino police coming to interdict us to take Evelyn off our hands, but also, uh, the Mal but also uh, Malaysians, uh, a lot of different groups were interested to come in and grab her in order to claim credit. At this point, after everything we had been through, there's no way I was letting Evelyn out of, my, out of even arm's, arm's length and we were armed to the teeth. There's no way that anybody coming over to come take her off her hands is going to be anything but a fight. So obviously we're not looking for a fight, so we try to get out of there and escape. So what the team did at the, uh, the Marine base on Holo was they told them, told the Marine Colonel that we were getting on, or that the team was getting on a helicopter. The next morning it would be at a helipad in Zamboanga at about noon. Instead what they did was they secreted out of the back gate, got on a ferry, rode it for about eight hours, and arrived in Zamboanga at about 6 a.m. From there, we got on a flight. We just, I don't know, Dennis somehow got us on a flight. We just literally drove out on the flight line and then got on the back of the plane um, and flew back to Manila, was intercepted by, um, intercepted by some Taiwanese uh, representatives, uh, got on a China Airlines flight, and when I was taxiing on the runway, Dennis texted me and said, hey, I'm on the, uh, the helipad right now in Zamboanga. The media is down here. The Filipino police is down here. Ha, ha, ha. They're all looking for you. 
And while we took off and practically literally giving the finger uh, on, on the way out back to Taiwan, uh, where when we hit the ground and the media was all over, all over the place, I was at the time stressed out of my mind and wanted to just, uh, actually I immediately bought a ticket to Bali uh, and then went down there to hang out for a little while. Um, but that's why the story has come out so much uh, in the media since. Uh, it was largely because of that Marine colonel who, who released the story. Otherwise, I think this could have been all done very quietly. So I tell you this story today, um, mostly because now it's been about a year, and I've had some time to process and think about uh, what I've learned from this experience, right? So the first thing I, I touched upon a little bit, and it's something that I saw in my own experiences in, in combat, was that war, yes, war is probably one of the ugliest things that we have uh, in, in the world today in terms of mankind. It is. There's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of, there's a lot of violence. All those things. But it's funny that in this ugliness and in this darkness, a lot of times this is where we see mankind's greatest attributes of sacrifice, brotherhood, integrity, honor. These type of things can't exist without that environment. I'm not promoting war or promoting the battlefield. But this is interesting for me when I look at this situation. Is that, for me, in terms of the motivation of of stepping forward and doing this was largely, uh, well, I'll return to that in a second, but was largely in the sense of just feeling a responsibility as though fate had brought me to this point where I had these experiences as being a counter-terrorist uh, counter commander in, in Iraq, had the experience of fighting the Abu Saf over a period of uh, nearly a couple years, and it was just very happenstance and coincidental, and I couldn't walk away. It seemed like fate had brought me to that, and everything that I learned in my experiences prepared me for that moment to do this, to do this thing. But it went down there, and then all these actors that had come forward, in spite of all this darkness and the light of it, of putting forward their self-sacrifice and putting their lives on the line, their careers on the line, that was something that was a very lasting thing that took, I took away. The second thing that I realized, too, is that in this experience, one of the reasons why I was able to do this is not because so much of the training. Yes, there were skills, knowledge, and ability as a Green Beret that I understood that I could apply in this situation. But really what it was was that I knew that from all the experiences of, I had in the military as an entrepreneur, as a writer, uh, even in finance here uh, in Hong Kong, was that I had the habit of facing failure and then recouping off of it. I had the habit of facing failure and iterating solutions off of it and knowing they could fix it. This mission, was, even though it was a success at the end, was rife with failure all the way, every single step of the way. But I knew that my personality and the habit that I had formed from challenging myself across many different forms was the key actually to giving me the confidence of doing this operation. Real confidence is not about knowing that you can succeed. It's about knowing that you're going to fail and knowing that you know how to operate and handle the iteration after that. Knowing how to handle yourself in the space after failure is what gives you confidence. So I would submit to the group when you talk about learning and continuing in your, your journey of, of education is to seek out challenges. And the harder, the better. The harder, the better. Because it's only when it's really hard that it's worth your time. It's only when it's really, really hard that the juice is worth the squeeze. And that's, I think, what is worthwhile, finding your time and finding those difficult challenges. Thanks. All right. Good message. So <laughs> go beyond. Identify the challenge and go for it. All right. So back to our story. We can clearly identify why an audience should listen to a speaker. We can build our credibility during speech, understand how to write a clear thesis statement, and design an effective preview of your speeches content for your audience. We should have a thesis statement. It should be short, declarative sentence that states a purpose, intent, or main idea for the speech. A clear, uh, strong, clear thesis statement is very valuable within the introduction because it lays out the basic goal of the entire speech. Basic functions of a thesis statement. A thesis statement helps your audience by letting them know in a nutshell what you're going to be talking about. With a good thesis statement, you will fulfill four basic functions. You will express your specific purpose, provide a way to organize your main points, make your research more effective, and enhance your delivery. 
like a weak example would be today I want to discuss academic cheating. Now we want to be more precise because academic cheating could mean many different concepts. So a better one is today I will clarify exactly what plagiarism is and give examples to different types so that you can see at least to a loss of creative learning interaction. That's a strong example because now you're telling me what kind of cheating. Because before I didn't know, are you talking about cheating on a test? Or are you talking about cheating on a paper? Are you talking about cheating on a presentation? What are you talking about? So we always want to be precise and clear because if we're not, we can have a misunderstanding and a miscommunication. We want to provide a way to organize your main points. So we want to have a clear thesis statement, especially important if you know a great deal about your topic or you have a strong feeling about it. If this is the case for you, you're going to need to know exactly what you're planning on talking about in order to fit within the specified time limits, knowing where you are and where you're going in the entire point in establishing a thesis statement. It makes your speech much easier to prepare and to present. Well, let's just say you have a fairly strong thesis statement and that you probably brainstormed a list of information that you already know about your topic. Chances are your list is too long and has no focus. So using your thesis statement, you can select only the information that is directly related to the thesis and can be arranged in a sequence that will make sense to the audience and will keep the support the thesis. In essence, a strong thesis statement helps you be useful information and weed out less information. Make your research more effective. If you begin your research with only a general topic in mind, you run the risk of spending hours reading Mountains of excellent literature about your topic. However, mountains of literature do not always make coherent speeches. You may have little or no idea about how to tie your research all together, or even whether you should tie it all together. If on the other hand, you conduct your research with a clear thesis statement in mind, you'll be better able to zero in only on the material that directly relates to your chosen thesis statement. Let's look at an example that illustrates the point. Many traffic accidents involve drivers older than 55. While the statement may be true, you could find industrial, medical, and insurance literature that drone an ad infirm about the details of such accidents in a year. Instead, focus your thesis will help you narrow your scope of information you're gonna be searching while gathering information. Here's an example of a more focused thesis statement. These factors contribute to more accidents involving drivers over 55 years of age. Falling eyesight, slower reflexes and rapidly changing traffic conditions. The framing is somewhat better. The thesis statement at least provides three possible main points and some keywords of your electronic catalog search. However, if you want your audience to understand the context of older people, at the wheel, consider something like this. Mature drivers over 55 years of age must cope with challenging driving conditions that existed only one generation ago. More traffic moving at higher speeds and increased imperative for quick driving decisions and rapidly changing ramp and clover leaf systems. Because of these challenges, I want my audience to believe that drivers over 65 should be required to pass a driving test every five years. The framing of the thesis provides interesting choices. First, several terms need to be defined, and these definitions might function surprisingly well at the setting the tone of a speech, your definition of the words like generation, quick driving decisions and clover leaf systems could jolt your audience out of assumptions they've taken for granted as truth. Second, the framing of these theses provides a way to describe the specific changes they occurred between say 1970 or 2010. How much and which ways have the volume and the speed of traffic changed? Why are quick decisions more critical now? What is a clover leaf and how does any driver deal co oh, cognitively with existing the direction seemingly opposite to the desired one? Questions like this suggested by your own thesis statement can lead to a strong memorable speech. Enhance your delivery. When your thesis is not clear to you, your listeners will be even more clueless than you are. But if you have a good clear thesis statement, your speech becomes clear to your listeners. When you stand in front of your audience presenting your introduction, you can vocally emphasize the essence of your speech expressed as your thesis statement. Many speakers pause for a half second 
lower their vocal pitch slightly and slow down a little and deliberately present the thesis statement. The one sentence that encapsulates the purpose. When this is done effectively, the purpose, intent, and main idea of a speech is driven home for an audience. Everybody knows about a thesis statement. How you write a thesis statement? Well, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna choose your topic and then you should have a, like a checklist, make sure you met all the criteria in your checklist. It does it clearly reflect the topic of your speech? Is it simple, is it direct? Does it have the audience interest in mind? Is it easy to understand? Linking attention getter to the speech topic is essential. So your main audience attention is that the relevance of the attention getter is clear to your audience. Establishing how your speech topic is relevant and important shows your audience why they should listen to your speech. To be an effective speaker, you should convey all the components of credibility, competence, trustworthiness, and caring and goodwill by the content delivered in the introduction. A clear thesis statement is essential to provide structure for a speaker and clarity in the audience. An effective preview identifies specific main points that will present the speech body. We want to analyze the introduction. So is your introduction one that you would want to listen to if you were somebody attending your own speech? Uh, example here is Smart Dust Introduction. That's what, this is what was written above, it's written again. In 2002, a famed science fiction writer, Michael Creighton, released his book, Prey, which is about a swarm of nanomachines that were feeding off living tissue. The nanomachines were solar powered, self-efficient, intelligent. Most disturbingly, the nanomachines would work together as a swarm as it took over and killed its prey and its need for new resources. Its attention getter is the antidote derived from the best selling novel, and it's called Prey. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie. I haven't seen the movie. I get freaked out when I watch those kind of movies because then sometimes things are similar to that in real life and I get freaked out. But it is a uh, bestseller science fiction. If you like science fiction, then you might like the book and the movie. The technology for this level of sophistication of nanotechnology is surprisingly more science back than science fiction. In 2000, three professors of electrical engineering and computer science at University of California in Berkeley, professors Kahn, Katz, and Pitzer, hypothesized in a journal of communications and networks, wireless, Networks of tiny microelectromagnetical sensors or MEMS, sensors, robots, or devices could detect phenomena including light, temperature, and vibration. The 2004 Fortune magazine listed smart dust as the first of their top 10 tech trends bet on. Thus far, researchers have hypothesized that smart dust could be used for anything from tracking patients in a hospital to early warnings of natural disasters as a defense against bioterrorism. <clears throat> so today we're going to explain what smart dust is and the various applications smart dust has in the future. This is a thesis statement example right here. Now on to the preview and the analysis. To help us understand small of it all, we first examine what smart dust is and how it works. Then we ex ex examine some military application of smart dust and we will end by discussing some non-military applications of smart dust. Here's some other examples like um, animal experimentation and life after having a child, pros and cons of cholesterol, on being a hero and LASIK eye surgery. Those would be some examples that people could have a thesis statement for and preview and then go right into the informational speech. Creating a body of a speech. I like to think of speech or even a paper, if you're writing a paper, but in this class is speech, it's kind of like a three course meal. You know, your appetizer, be it chips or maybe cheese sticks, that is like your introduction. It's a tension getter. It's kind of like when you go to three course meal, they want to get you excited about the meal. So they give you like a little tidbit just to like 
um, help you not be hangry while they're waiting for your food to get made. But the body of your paragraph is where you have your main points. And that's where the entree is, right? That's where the meat is. That's where the protein is. That's where the substance of the meal is right there in the body. So it's like a three course meal. Then your conclusion is a lot like your dessert. It would be the best part. They save the best for last. At the very end, you want to make sure that you summarize it all. You gave any uh, last minute tidbits. You want to leave somebody something sweet to remember your speech by when they leave. That's why it's like a three course meal. You want to create the body of speech in a series of important and groundbreaking studies conducted during the 1950s and 60s. The researchers started investigating how a speech organization was released to an audience perception of those speeches. The first study conducted by Raymond Smith of 1951 randomized organized parts of the speech to see how audiences could react. Not surprisingly, when speeches were randomly organized, the audience perceived the speech more negatively than the audiences were presented with the speech with clear intentional organization. Smith also found the audience who listened to unorganized speeches were less interested in those speeches than audience who listened to organized speeches. Thomas further investigation and found that unorganized speeches were harder for audiences to recall after the speech. Basically people remember information from speeches that are clearly organized and forget information from speeches that are poorly organized. A third study by Baker found that when audiences were presented with disorganized speaker, they were less likely to be persuaded and saw disorganized speakers lacking credibility. These three important studies make the importance of organizations very clear. When speakers are not organized, they are not perceived as credible and their audiences view the speeches negatively. They're less likely to be persuaded and don't remember specific information from speeches after the fact. We wanna revisit the function of specific purpose, understand how to make trans transaction from the specific purpose to a series of main points. We wanna be able to narrow the speech from possible points to the main points and explain how to prepare meaningful main points. We like the word strategic because it refers to determining what's important or essential to the overall plan and purpose of your speech. What's a specific purpose? We have the who, what, where, when, why, and how of a speech. A specific purpose to inform a group of school administrators about various open source software packages that could be utilized in their school districts. To persuade, to persuade a group of college students to make the switch from the Microsoft Office to the open source office suite and open office. To entertain, to entertain members of a business organization with the mock eulogy of a for pay software giants as a result of proliferation of open source alternatives. You want specific purpose to main purpose. Uh, how many main points do we need? Narrowing down your main points when you write your specific purpose and review the speech you have done on your topic, you're probably going to find yourself thinking quite a few points that you like to make in your speech. Whether it's the case or not, we recommend taking a few minutes to brainstorm and develop a list of points. In brainstorming, your goal is simply to think about as many different points as you can, not judge how valuable or important they are. What information does your speech need to know how to understand your topic? What information does your speech need to convey to accomplish its specific purpose? Consider these following examples. Specific purpose to inform a group of school administrators about the various open source software package that could be utilized in their school districts. Open open uh, source software, define educational software, list and describe the software commonly used by school districts, explain the advantage of using open source software, explain the advantages of using open source software. Then these are more brainstorming lists, review the history of open source software, Describe the value of open source software. Describe some educational open software packages. Review the software needs of my specific audience. And describe some problems that have occurred with open source software. So specific purposes here, 
to inform a group of school administrators about the various open source software packages that could be utilized by school districts. We have school districts use software in their operations, uh, define educational software, list and describe software commonly used by school districts. Then we have what is open source software to explain it with the next point, define the open source software, review the history of open source software. Then moving on, with also main point two, you can explain the advantages of using open source software, describe the value of open source software, explain the disadvantages of open source software, describe some problems that have occurred with open source software. Then main point three, name some specific uh, open source software packages that may be appropriate for the school administrators to consider, like review software needs of my specific audience and describe some educational open software packages. Uniting your main points. Ask yourself this question, when I look at the main points, do they fit together? Keeping your main points separate in the next question, ask yourself about the main points, whether they overlap too much. Balancing main points. One of the biggest mistakes some speakers make is spending too much time talking about their main points, completely neglecting the main points. To avoid this mistake, organize your speech so it tend roughly the same amount of time on each main point. If you find the one main point is simply too large, you may need to divide the main points into two main points and consolidate your main points into a single main point. Let's see if our preceding example is balanced. School districts use software in their operations. What is the open source software? Name some specific open source software packages that may be appropriate for the school administrators to consider. What do you think? Obviously, the answer depends on how much time a speaker will have to talk about these main points. If you have an hour to talk, then you may find that these three main points are balanced. However, you may find them wildly unbalanced if you only have five minutes to speak because five minutes is not enough time to even explain what open source software is. If that's the case, then you're probably going to rethink specific purpose to ensure that you can cover material in a lot of time. Also, you can create parallel structure to the main points. Another main question to ask yourself about main points is whether or not they have parallel structure. By parallel structure, we mean that you should structure your main points so that they all sound similar. When all your main points sound similar, it's easier for your audiences to remember your main points and retain them for later. Let's look up a sample. School districts use software in operation. What's the open source software? Some of the specific open source software packages uh, that may be appropriate for the school administrators to consider. Notice that the first and the third main points are statements, but the second one is not a question. Basically, we have an example here of two main points that are not parallel in structure. You could fix this in one of two ways. You can make them all questions. What are some common school districts, software programs? What is the open source software? And what are some specific open source software? Packages that may be appropriate for school administrators to consider, or you could turn them onto statements. School districts use software in their operations, define and describe open source software. Some Name some specific open source software packages that may be appropriate for these school administrators to consider. Either of these changes will make the grammatical structure of the points parallel. Maintain the logical flows of main points. The last question you wanna ask yourself about the main point is whether these main points make sense in the order that you place them. The next section goes into more detail of common organizational patterns for speeches, but we want to know what you think logically about the flow of your main points. When you look at your main points, you can see them as progressive or it does not make sense to talk about one another or a second or the final last one. If you look at your order and it doesn't make sense to you, you probably need to rethink the flow of your main points. Often the process is an art and not a science, but let's look at a couple examples. Example one, history of school dress codes. Main point two, Problems with school dress codes. Main point three, eliminating school dress codes. Main point one, why should the states have writer laws? Two, what's the effects of the lack of writer laws? Three, what is a writer law legislation? You can see that those are examples of three different points. So when a basic speech, that's not too long, having three points is a really good idea. 
try to think of it like your entree. What do you get with it? Do you get maybe meatloaf and two veggies? That would be like your main points here. You would get your, your three topics there, right? That are all connected. Like the uniform one, right? They have three examples. So try to think of it like a, a meal that includes three. Maybe the protein with two sides. Maybe it's meatloaf with corn on the cob and broccoli. Or maybe it's chicken fried steak with a side of mashed potatoes and coleslaw, just like your main points. So then at the end, you could summarize by having a short conclusion, like a small dessert at the end so that the people have something to remember you by when they leave. So the takeaway here is all speeches start with general purpose and then move to specific purpose that the who, what, where, when, and how of the speech. Transitioning from specific purpose to possible main points means developing a list of potential main points you can discuss. Then you can narrow your focus by looking at similarities among the potential main points and combining ones that are similar. Shorter speeches will have two main points while longer speeches will generally have three or more main points. When creating your main points, make sure that they're united, separate, balanced, parallel, and logical. Categorial and topical. Here's some more examples like uh, main points, life in the dorms, life in the classroom, and life on campus. Those are all the different places a student could be, right? Uh, another main point, a specific purpose would be to inform a group of college students about the issues and misuses of internet dating. Main points, number one, could be define and describe internet dating. Two, explain some st strategies to enhance your internet dating experience. And three, List some warning signs to look for potential online dates. Another method in organizing your main point is the comparison and contrast speech pattern. While the pattern clearly leads itself to two main points, you can create a third point by giving basic information about what's being compared and what's being contrasted. Let's look at two examples here. The first one would be a two point example and the second is a three point. The specific purpose to inform a group of physicians about drug X, a newer drug with similar applications to drug Y. Main points, one, show how drug X and drug Y are similar. Two, show how drug X and drug Y differ. Next, to inform a group of physicians about drug X, a newer drug with similar applications to drug Y. Main points, explain the purpose and use of drug X and drug Y. Show how drug X and drug Y are similar. Three, show how drug X and drug Y are different. Special, special speech pattern organize information according to how things fit together in a physical space. The pattern is best used when the main points are orientated to different locations that exist interdependently. The basic reason to choose this format is to show the main points have clear locations. We'll look at two examples here, one involving physical geography and uh, involving a different special order. To inform a group of history students about the states seceded from the United States during the Civil War, one, locate and describe Confederate states just below the Mason-Dixon line, Virginia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Two, locate and describe Confederate states in the Deep South, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida. And three, locate and describe Western Confederate States, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. Yes, I live in a con formerly con uh, Confederate state. I live in a town that has Confederate soldier statues and some old Confederate houses. However, I will tell you that there's a new uh, group of people living here. And they're from all different places, different states, different places in the world, and they don't like it. So um, they've been fixing up the town and they've been taking down some of the Confederate flags and some of the statues because it's not welcoming. Um, where I live, it was a Confederate town. I live in uh, Belton, Texas. And in the old days, they had Mr. Nolan here. They had Mr. Austin here. They had Mr. Houston here. And then they all went and created their own cities, but they are all from here. And they're also slaves too, which is sad. Um, there is Sons of Confederate Soldiers. It's a group and they don't like that they're changing the town. But you know what? 
life progresses and you want to be inclusive and you want to be inviting and you don't want to lose money. If you don't make your town friendly, you won't be getting business from other places. So avoid your town and then you'll be poor and you'll lose money. So they should look at it from the perspective of business. I look at its perspective of Jesus and Jesus doesn't like discrimination. Jesus doesn't like when we segregate, because we're all one, you know, he created us in his image and his likeness and we're all beautiful, you know, and he didn't make us all to look the same because he didn't want us to be clones, right? So that's why he made us all different. So that's just my little take on it. Yes, I do live there right now. Um, I'm doing research for my books while I'm over here and we'll see where they go, so. And then we'll see what happens. I might want to do another book. Who knows? There's a lot of topics I keep thinking of. And you can do a special speech on geography. So you could do explain to a group of college biology students how the urinary system works. Our main points here, locate and describe the kidneys and the, the ureters. You can locate and describe the bladder. You can locate and describe the sphincter and the urethra. You could do chronological. It's a speech pattern places and main ideas in the time order in which they appear, whether backward or forward. A simple example here is to inform my audience about the books written by Winston Churchill. I want to examine the style and content of Winston Churchill's writings prior to World War II. I want to explain the style and content of Winston Churchill's writings during World War II. And I want to explain the style and content of Winston Churchill's writing in World War II. I could do biographical. Maybe I'm writing about somebody. Uh, the purpose here is to inform my audience of the early life of Marilyn Manson. Uh, describe Brian Hughes Warner's early life and beginning his feud in Christianity. Uh, describe Warner's stint in the music journalist in Florida and describe Warner's decision to create Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids. Um, Marilyn Manson, I don't know if you've ever heard his music, but he's kind of dark. You know, he wears a lot of black, kind of like a gothic. And I had a roommate that liked his music in college. And I mean, he, he does have a good message, but then he uses bad language, bad words. And sometimes what he has in his music videos is not appropriate, right? But he did have a music video called Beautiful People. And I must have watched it a bunch of times because it's like my roommate's favorite mu musical song and her favorite music video. I heard that song so much that it's been over 10 years and I still know the song in my head. It was beautiful people. Yeah, that was like the whole, the whole song. And I remember it was like, oh, da, 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 beautiful people. And she listened to it all the time that even it's ingrained in my head, even though I haven't heard the song in over 10 years, even though I, you know what I mean? It's still in my head. We can also do a uh, casual. Let's look at this example here uh, from, to inform my audience about the problems associated with drinking among members of the Native American tribal groups. Uh, one is explain the history and prevalence of drinking alcohol among Native Americans. Two, explain the effects of abusive alcohol has on Native Americans and how it differs from the experience of other populations. And to inform local voters of the problem of domestic violence in our city, explain that there's a significantly more arrests for domestic violence in our city than other cities of comparable size and state and list causes of the difference which may be interrelated in the actual amount of domestic violence problem cause solution a uh, specific purpose here is to persuade a civic group to support a citywide curfew for individuals under the age of 18. Main points, demonstrate that vandalism and violence among youth is having a negative effect on our community and show how vandalism and violence among youth go up after 10 p.m. in our community. And next one, explain how instituting a mandatory curfew of 10 p.m. would reduce vandalism and violence in our community. We could do a psychological organization. So like it leads from B to B to C. The speech is designed to follow a logical argument. So a specific purpose is to persuade a group of nurses to use humor and healing that person. Main points, how laughing affects the body, how bodily effects can help in healing, strategies used for humor and healing. 
Speakers use a variety of different organizational patterns, including categorical, topical, compare and contrast, uh, special, chronological, biographical, mm, casual problem solution, psychological. Ultimately, speakers must really think about organizational pattern that suits a specific purpose. Don't forget your transitions and signposts. Uh, use those conjunctions to know. Uh, Schoolhouse Rock has a music video. I can't show it to you because sometimes it flags it. Not as inappropriate because Disney bought rights to it, so I'm not allowed to show it to anybody. But it's called Conjunction Function with Schoolhouse Rock. And you can click on it, and it's just mentioning that and, or, and but. Those are the basic ones, but there's other ones you can add as well. Those transitional words will help you go from one sentence to another, one paragraph to another, one page to another, and one section to another, et cetera. So these are some of the examples. <clears throat> these are all the different words you can use. We have the addition words, we have the consequence words, we have the generalizing words, exemplifying words, illustration words, emphasis words, similarity words, exception words, restatement words, compare and contrast words, sequence words, common, a sequence pattern, summarizing words, diversion words, direction words, and location words. Like I said, signposts is, is a good one. Um, think about a signpost, like if you're driving, you see the signs, you know, 50 miles to go, 25 miles to go. To be honest, sometimes when I'm driving, I'm just looking to see when the bathroom's coming or maybe like a place to eat. The first function of credibility is competence. The second function of credibility is trustworthiness. And the final function of credibility is caring and goodwill. We've been reviewing that today. All right. When we analyze the speech body earlier, we mentioned about the smart desk speech. So to help us understand smart desk, we must begin to focus of what smart dust is. Dr. Chris Peter, professor of robotics lab at University of California, Berkeley, originally conceived the idea of smart dust in 1998 as a part of a funded defense advancement research projects agency, DARPA. According to the 2001 article written by Brett Worski, Matt Lass, Brian Larshes, and Chris Butzer at the small desk, communicating with cubic millimeter computer published in computer, Peter's goal was to build a device that contained a built-in sensor communication device and a small computer that could be integrated into a cubic millimeter package. For comparison purposes, Doug Steele in 2005, white paper titled Smart Dust, written by CT by our College of Business at University of Houston, noted that a single gain, grain of rice has a volume of five cubic millimeters each individual piece of dust called a moat would have to have ability to interact with other moats or supercomputers. As Steve Lohr wrote in January 30th, 2010, edition of New York Times, an article entitled Smart Dust, not quite, but we're getting there. Smart Dust could eventually consist of tiny digital sensors sewn around the globe, gathering sorts of information and communicating powerful computer networks to monitor, measure, and understand physical world in new ways. Kind of reminds me of the movie The Circle, if you've ever seen that. And yes, Tom Hanks plays the bad guy. But that one is a good one too, because it kind of reminds people of like Facebook and Google and those kind of uh, scientific computer information system, social networking companies. It's a good one you haven't seen. It's called The Circle. And now that we explain what smart dust is, let's switch gears and talk about some of the military applications for smart dust. This smart dust was originally conceptual under a grant by DARPA. Military uses of smart dust have been widely theorized and examined. According to smart dust website, smart dust could eventually be used for battlefield surveillance, treaty monitoring, transportation monitoring, said hunting and clear military applications. Probably the number one benefit of smart dust in the military environment is surveillance abilities. 
Major Scott Dickinson of Blue Horizons paper written in the Center of Strategy and Technology for United States Air Force. War College C Smart Desk is helping the military in battle space awareness, homeland security, and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, WMD identification. Furthermore, Major Dixon also believes that it may be possible to create smart desk that has the ability to defeat communications jamming equipment created by foreign governments, which could help the US military not only communicate with itself, but could also increase communications with civilian and military combat zones. On a much larger scale, smart dust could even help the US military and NASA protect the earth. According to a 2010 article written by Jessica Riggs of the New Scientist, one of the first benefits of smart dust could be early defense warning of space storm and other debris that could be catastrophic. Now that we explored some of the military benefits of smart dust, let's switch gears and see how smart dust may be able to have an impact on our daily lives. And see how smart dust may be able to impact our daily lives. According to Smart Dust website, Smart Dust could quickly become a part of our daily lives. Everything from passing Smart Dust particles on our fingertips to create a virtual computer keyboard to inventory control of a product quality control discussed in possible applications for Smart Dust. The applications for sensor based computing experts say include a building that manages their own energy bridge, bridges that sense motion and metal fatigue to tell engineers they need repairs, cars that track traffic patterns and report potholes, and fruit and vegetable shipments that tell a grocer when they ripen and when they spoil. Medically, according to Smart Dust Project website, Smart Dust would be help disabled people interface with computers. Theoretically, we can be interjected with Smart Dust, which relies information to physicians and detects adverse changes in our body instantly. Smart Dust could detect microscopic formations of cancer cells or alert us when we've been affected by a bacteria or virus that could speed up treatment and prolong all our lives. Now that you had a chance to read the body of the speech on smart dust, take a second and attempt to conduct your own analysis of the speech body. What are the main points? Do you think the main points made sense? What about organizational pattern used? Were there clear transitions? What other techniques are used to keep the speech moving? The evidence used to support the speech. Well, there's the speech there. We just read it. And then when he used the signpost now, he used a transition now to go to the second. He also said now for the third. All right, now it's time for another video. This is how to speak so people will listen. I think we we watched that one already. Sorry. Okay, this is how to find passion and make it your job. Let's watch this speech. 
and find out if she's passionate or not. Wow, look at this. 94% of people believe company culture is important to an organization's success. Hello. So I want to start by asking you to raise your hands if you know exactly what it is you want to do when you leave education. I can see about six hands. Okay. Now, I want you to raise your hand if you have a few more general ideas or actually you have no idea at all. Okay, that's, that's, that's the vast majority of you. So, not that long ago at all, I was sitting where you are today and I had no idea either. I had no idea when I was at school, when I was at college, then at university. And when I finally entered the workplace in my early 20s, I didn't know then either. And what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about what I did about that problem. So, to set the scene, I want you to come with me to a wintry Monday morning in November, three years ago. It's 6.35 a.m. and it's cold out, it's dark, it's raining, basically like this morning, and I hadn't slept all night. All night, I was kept awake by the thought of having to go to work the next day. I had a tight knot of stress in my chest, and it had prevented me from sleeping all night long from worry. And so, eventually, my alarm went off. I had to get up, and I had to go and face the day ahead at work. And what I had was a really bad case of the Sunday night blues. So I had quite a good job. I was working on a corporate graduate scheme that I'd worked really, really hard to get onto. My parents were really proud of me. I was earning a good salary. I had job security, job stability. I was using all the skills that I'd learned at university, and I had a clear path of progression. I ticked all the boxes. I had won the career lottery. But yet, every day when I woke up, I dreaded going to work. Absolutely dreaded the idea. And it took me a whole other year to figure out that actually what had been my dream, my dream job that had ticked all of my boxes, it turns out that it was not for me. And that was okay. So that begged the question, what on earth is for me? I had no idea. I was back to square one. So, in a fit of despair, one night, I wrote down a list of all the different careers I had ever wanted to try. Everything from when you're asked as a small child what you want to be when you grow up, and you say astronaut or firefighter, prime minister. So, my list had 25 jobs on it. And they ranged from really traditional, sensible professions to slightly more unusual, but still fairly mainstream ones. Then the third category seemed completely random. There were things that I'd been told weren't real jobs at all. But they all had one thing in common. All of them were things that I'd secretly dreamed of doing my entire life, but for one reason or another, had never had the opportunity to fully explore them. But in my mid-twenties, I was still curious about them now. I sat back on the couch, I started daydreaming, trying to picture Emma, the author, Emma, the explorer, Emma, the archaeologist. And there were so many different possible selves to choose from, and each one was totally unrecognizable from my current reality. And that day, sitting on that couch, I decided that I was going to try every single one on that list in a year before my 25th birthday. And I was just about to turn 24, so that worked out as roughly one every two weeks. I was going to quit my job and take a radical sabbatical. So I handed my notice at work, which was both the most terrifying and the most liberating day of my life, and I set about, I set about trying all these different jobs. They ranged from wedding photography, 
publishing to being an extra in a movie. Then there was teaching, tour guiding, and interior design. After that, there was working in the police dogs unit. There was landscape gardening and blogging. And just as I'd always dreamed, there were adventures by exploring in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. There was travel writing in Venezuela and archaeology in Transylvania, of all places. So what I want to do now is tell you a little bit about what I learned doing all of these jobs and the three most important things that I learned from doing so many jobs in so many different industries. So the first thing is about starting your career search, not by thinking about jobs, but by thinking about who you are as a person. So set jobs aside for a minute and see how you'd answer these three questions. And when I did this, I went back to my list of 25 and I changed some of them. So first up is what skills do you want to be using and what skills are you good at? And they're not necessarily the same thing, but what you need to do is try and find the crossover about where they are. So this could be things like teamwork or leadership, it could be analyzing data, problem solving, or writing. Second question is, what do you want to get out of the workplace? And all too often, we think about how we fit into a job or a career type. We don't consider how well it suits us. So this could be something like making a difference, having a positive impact on society. Or it could be variety, not wanting to do the same thing month in, month out. Or perhaps it's autonomy, you being in control of your workload. The third thing to think about is working environment. And this is something that's very often overlooked. And actually, it can make a substantial difference to your happiness at work on a day-to-day -day basis. So, do you want to be a power dresser going into a slick city office? Or maybe you like the idea of doing something practical, outdoors, or using your hands. Do you want to be working for a large international company that will send you around the world? Or do you like the idea of starting your own business as an entrepreneur with your two best mates in your garden shed? Use your answers to these questions to objectively assess how well different sorts of jobs suit you. So the second thing I want to talk to you about is the sheer importance of getting multiple work experience placements in a diverse range of careers. So I think careers should be like dating. Very few of us end up marrying the first person that we kiss or the first person we go on a date on, date with. But with our careers, that's exactly what we do. We marry our first career. And what I think we should be doing is dating around. We need to date a few more careers. Because doing so allows you to make career decisions based on knowledge and experience, rather than based on assumption, hearsay, or perhaps expectation. And I think this point about assumption is really, really important. And it's something that I learned a lot more about during doing so many different jobs. There was one job in particular that showed that. And bizarrely, that was alpaca farming. So this job I got through Twitter, of all things. I sent out a tweet, said, I quite like to try farming. Don't know any farmers. But in 10 minutes, an alpaca farmer from Cornwall got in touch and said, come and work for me. I thought, OK, sure, why not? Um, and it was September. I was, it was still quite warm out. I was hoping to go down, maybe get a bit of a tan at the same time. When we spoke on the phone, she said, absolutely not. You need to come in January. Because if you like farming in January, when the weather is miserable, you're meant to be a farmer. It was such good logic that I couldn't disagree with her. So a few months later, January rolled round, got in my car, and I drove down to Cornwall. My phone signal did that. So there was a little X at the bottom of my phone. And I arrived in the middle of the night, and the first thing I did was step into a puddle and wonder what on earth I was doing with my life. I woke up the next morning, though, and the hillside was covered in a glittering frost. I put on about seven jumpers and went outside. And I did all the things that I'd always thought I would do, farming. So feeding animals, animal husbandry, helping the ewes with lambing. It was fantastic. But then it got to lunchtime and sat down with the farmer. She turned to me and said, that's less than half of what I do. Because to be a sustainable farmer in the 21st century, I have to be an entrepreneur as well. I have to actually make a living selling the produce from my farm. And she had multiple lines of business. 
But the one that she told me about and that I worked on while I was there was well, she took her alpacas, she sheared them, she got the wool spun into yarn, and then the yarn was made into high-end luxury children's wear that she sold to Harrods. And she managed every single step in that process, from helping an alpaca give birth to negotiating with Harrods. Imagine all the different steps in that process on top of the regular jobs of being a farmer. And what this showed was how many business acumen skills you needed, as well as combining with a practical outdoor job. And it showed how completely wrong I'd been about this career. I was so wrong about it, and I would never have known if I hadn't have gone and seen for myself, if I hadn't learned by doing. So the last thing I want to talk to you about today is about what happened after I tried all those different jobs. Because I loved more than one of them. I loved quite a lot of them. And this left me with a new problem, how to choose. I realized that all my life, I've been trying really hard to be a high achiever. But it turns out that's not what I was. What I was was a wide achiever. And what I also realized was that maybe I didn't need to just choose one. But maybe don't apply that to the dating analogy. Um, Growing up, I'd always assumed you can only do one job, but what doing so many different jobs showed me was that, in fact, this isn't necessarily the case at all. In fact, this is a flawed assumption. What I could have was a portfolio career. And this is the concept of having multiple jobs at the same time in either the same or in different industries, and doing so by part-time freelance or contract work. I could take the skills that I was best at and that I enjoyed most, and I could specialize in those rather than industry-specific knowledge. I could take my skills, and instead of applying them vertically in one industry, I could apply them horizontally in many. So if we fast forward a year, I'm now 26, and I finished my project just over a year ago. I chose to specialize in communications, both in terms of written and verbal through speaking. And over the past year and a bit, I have officially had seven jobs. And I see that as something to be proud of, not something to hide. I think a portfolio career can show opportunity in what is traditionally seen as fickleness or indecision, because instead it can show traits like flexibility, adaptability, resilience, the ability to learn quickly. Given that 65% of the jobs that you will do don't even exist yet, and that our careers are likely to span well into the, our mid-70s as ultra-marathons, and that we will have over five career changes, not job changes, career changes each. I think these are pretty useful skills to have. But ultimately, I think it's about happiness. Figuring out what job or jobs you want to do and getting the experience to see if they are right for you. Happy people have been proven to earn more both for themselves and for their companies or organizations, and to work harder. So it is in everyone's interest that you love what you do. Both yours, your friends, your families, the people you work with, and the people you work for. We often hear throwaway statements like, follow your passions or achieve your potential. But what I hope this talk has done has given you some insight as to how you can practically go away and figure those things out. Because these days, Every day, I wake up and look forward to the day ahead. And I don't think that I should be the outlier. I think that should be the norm, your norm. Thank you. I want to take on the world's toughest hackers. And this is where it's done. So, what do you think? All right. So, that's finding passion and you make it your job. So today we saw a couple of different speakers. The first one was very serious about, you know, his injury while he was serving in the military with his job. The second one was about rescuing somebody that was kidnapped. And our third one that we watched, it was finding your passion and making it your job.
All right. So that concludes today's lesson. Thank you so much, everybody, for hanging in there. And I will see you all next week at the same time on Monday. Bye. Have a blessed and beautiful week.